Okay, in this video, we are going to talk about fever of unknown origin. We are going to discuss what is fever of unknown origin, what are the causes of fever of unknown origin, and how do you manage and do work up for fever of unknown origin. First of all, what is fever of unknown origin? Temperature greater than 38.3 degrees Celsius recorded on multiple occasions that last for greater than three weeks with no clear etiology despite doing investigations on the patient on three different outpatient visits patient was running fever for three weeks patient comes to your opd patient comes to the clinic and you do investigations then you are unable to find out the cause or the patient was running fever for three weeks and patient gets admitted to you and it's the third day of admission and you still don't know the cause of fever or one week of invasive ambulatory investigation, you have done an invasive investigation and still you are unable to find out the cause. The patient is frustrated now because he is running fever for greater than three weeks and still you don't know the cause. That is fever of unknown origin. Usually when the fever patient presents to you, when you take the history, you usually find a focus. Patient is either having a cough, patient is either having a burning micturition, patient is either having a sore throat or patient is having an abscess patient is running having a cellulitis there is an obvious cause of fever but in fever of unknown origin you are unable to find out the cause that is fever of unknown origin and that fever is not settling down patient is still running fever for greater than three weeks that is fever of unknown origin now fever of unknown origin has three main causes there are three main categories in which we divide fever of unknown origin. First and the most important one and the most common one are the infections. Second one is inflammatory or rheumatic diseases, also called as the autoimmune diseases. Third one is malignancy. Now remember that fever of unknown origin is usually a common disease presenting with an atypical signs and symptoms. Most of the time, you will find out that fever of unknown origin is caused by a common disease presenting with atypical symptoms rather than a rare disease presenting with its common symptoms. So rather than looking out for the rare diseases, first of all, you should always rule out the common diseases and you should always search out the atypical presentations of those common diseases. Then you will be able to find out the cause of fever of unknown origin. Other causes are categorized into miscellaneous. Now, infections are the most common one. Almost 55% of the cases of fever of unknown origin, especially in these third world countries and even worldwide, are infections. In developed countries, inflammatory causes are rheumatic diseases, autoimmune diseases are a common cause of fever of unknown origin. 34% of the cases and malignancies contribute for 35% of the cases of fever of unknown origin. Infections are the most common cause of fever of unknown origin. And the most common ones are usually the most common cause of fever of unknown origin just because that they are presenting with the atypical symptoms now. Then you miss the diagnosis. Tuberculosis, typhoid, malaria presenting with intermittent fever. Fever comes and fever goes. There is a period in which patient is totally fine. Patient is not having any fever. And when the fever comes, it comes with a spike and there are chills associated with it. Brucellosis. In these third world countries, uh, there are some families, when you take the history, they would be living in the same room where they would be having the cattle. They are taking unpasteurized milk. Infective endocarditis caused by organisms that do not grow on culture mediums. Urinary tract infection without any symptoms like burning maturation, a hidden UTI. Abscess is not a clear obvious abscess on the skin abscess that is hidden inside the body a psoas abscess leptospira patient running fever with deranged rfts coming from a lower background leptospira is a very important and a common cause there are many other causes coxiella bruneti there are many other bacteria that can cause uh, in uh, fever of unknown origin but i have listed the most common ones coming to inflammatory or rheumatic diseases after infections, 
usually inflammatory or autoimmune diseases especially in young females presenting to you with a long history of fever fever greater than 3 weeks and the fever is not resolving adult onset stills disease sle vasculitis vasculitis like takayasu arthritis bechet's disease these are the common causes of inflammatory or rheumatic diseases you do the anti nuclear antibody test and ana test comes out to be positive a cause of fever of unknown origin malignancies in 35% of the cases hidden lymphomas as we will discuss in the workup that the patient in the patients you are unable to find out the cause of fever and then you slowly and gradually progress to the workup and you are unable to find anything and when you go toward a ct tap a ct of thoracic abdomen pelvis you find out enlarged lymph nodes are hidden in the body that are not obvious outside but they are hidden in the periaortic region and those uh, lymph nodes are not available for examination but they are hidden inside hidden lymphomas hodgkin non hodgkin leukemias renal cell carcinomas multiple myeloma in old category patients with generalized body x and fever and they turned out to have abnormal proteins in their body monoclonal antibodies in their body atrial myxoma colonic adenocarcinoma patient with iron deficiency anemia an old patient with uh, constipation alternating with diarrhea this is a presentation of a colonic adenocarcinoma in old patient in a patient in an old patient with iron deficiency anemia you should always look for colon cancers coming to miscellaneous causes miscellaneous causes include drug fever drugs the sulfur drugs that are commonly used in the hospitals like furosemide these sulfur drugs can cause drug fever the drugs used to treat fever are resulting in the fever so the main thing that you do in drug fever is that you ask the patient you stop all the drugs for the next 72 hours and you see that patient fever subsides or not you stop all the drugs and if the fever is still there after 72 hours it means that it's not the drugs causing drug fever and if the fever defervesces if the fever goes away after in within 72 hours after stopping the drugs it is the drug fever post mi patients can have fever stroke any cns lesion like pontine hemorrhage can present with fever because the central thermostat is disturbed and the central thermostat rises the temperature of the body stroke is a cause of fever without absence of uh, in the absence of infection patient is having fever after stroke because stroke itself is a cause of fever cns fever catheters in place look for the catheters sometimes the catheters have not been changed and they are causing infection healthcare associated fever of unknown origin when the patient is in the hospital for a longer period of time and patient is running fever there are causes that can happen within the hospital that can result in fever those causes include drug fever as we discussed intravascular catheter related infections very common venous thromboembolism patients are immobilized usually patient develop stroke patient have certain uh, moribund diseases and they are lying on the bed for a longer period of time and they develop dvts they develop pulmonary embolism and fever can be a sign of that they are receiving multiple antibiotics and due to multiple antibiotics they develop clostridium difficile infection and that clostridium difficile infection can present as fever inflammatory response to surgery usually within 24 hours of surgery patients uh, come out of the operation theater and they develop fever that is an inflammatory response to surgery when an immunodeficient patient is admitted with you a patient that is having hiv with low cd4 count or a patient that is having multiple comorbidities like diabetes mellitus chronic kidney disease many other comorbidities and you think that the immune system is weak in such patients in such immunodeficient patients always look for have an eye for opportunistic infections as well look for candidiasis hiv patients usually develop esophageal candidiasis and esophageal candidiasis is a age defining illness 
aspergillosis fungal infections are common very common because fungi do not invade the body of a healthy man but they will invade the body of a person who is immunocompromised thytomegalovirus infection hiv associated infections like pneumocystic pneumonia causing ground glass pneumonia in patients mac mycobacterium avium cellulare kaposi sarcoma these are the causes that you should have in mind when you are having an hiv positive patient a patient that is immunocompromised now when you have a patient of fever of unknown origin the first and the foremost thing is the history and examination nothing is more important no investigation is more important than the history from the patient and the examination from the patient almost 50 to 60% of the information that you can collect and the causes that you can find out are from the history and examinations of the patient perform detailed examination of the patient starting from head to toe neurological examination abdominal examination looking for hepatomegaly splenomegaly to look for uh, lymph nodes in the body perform chest examination perform the lower limb examination in these examinations you will find out you will find out certain hints and those hints will lead you to the diagnosis in the clinical examination never miss out fundoscopy examination of the eye because in the eyes you can find out rot spots and those rot spots can occur in infective endocarditis as we discuss the common causes of infections the hidden infections another very important thing that you will have to do in these patients of fever of unknown origin stop all the drugs that that patient is taking even the antipyretics stop each and everything stop steroids stop antipyretics stop all the antibiotics stop each and every medication that patient is taking for at least 72 hours if you cannot stop them for a longer period of time at least stop it for the 72 hours to see to exclude the drug fever if there is no fever after 72 hours it's one of the drugs that is causing the fever then you order the relevant exam investigations in the relevant investigations perform the baseline investigations the common investigations because in those common investigations you will find a hint that where you can go ahead for the diagnosis in the baseline you will have to perform the cbc with the differential counts acute phase reactants including esr erythrocyte sedimentation rate esr greater than 100 mm per hour is more likely associated with a malignancy or an infection infection including tuberculosis a highly elevated esr crp crp is elevated and it is more commonly elevated in bacterial it can also be elevated in viral infections but it is commonly elevated in uh, bacterial infections so you cannot differentiate but you can just say that it is more commonly elevated in bacterial infections do ferritin these are the acute phase reactants that will hint you toward the diagnosis perform the liver function test to look for look for alts look for alkaline phosphatase elevated alkaline phosphatase elevated uh, um, alt in young females with no hepatitis b no hepatitis c infection look for autoimmune hepatitis resulting in fever look for serum electrolytes look for hyponatremia look at ldh ldh is really elevated in infections but if the ldh is in thousands this is malignancy this points out that there is some hidden malignancy there and there is breakdown of malignancy because ldh in thousands is usually seen in malignancies perform you then perform uric acid levels perform serum calcium levels serum calcium to look for a hyperparathyroidism uric acid to look for breakdown hyperuricemia will indicate that there is some breakdown going on in the body and there might be a malignancy creatinine kinase level cpk levels elevated in myositis in myopathies perform urinalysis you perform urine culture you take one set of urine culture the midstream one one sample only you take the blood cultures you take three sets of blood culture you take more sets of blood culture to exclude any chances of uh, contamination from staph epidermidis contamination from the hands any abnormal technique you grow aerobic bacteria and anaerobic bacteria separately on those sets of sample you take them from different sides you you take them by good technique 
usually when these patients of fever of unknown origin they come to you and they are having this long fever usually they have already taken antibiotics and the cultures that you perform usually turn out to be negative but it is very important that still you do the blood cultures virology you do the hepatitis usually the patients young patients present to you with fatigue and mild fever and when you do the virology they are they are not having such elevated alts and jaundice and things like that they are having hepatitis b or c positive so that can be an atypical presentation of a common disease then you also do the basic imaging basic imaging like x ray of the chest to look for tuberculosis to look for hidden occult infection to look for atypical infections like like the walking pneumonia patient is having mild infection of um, mycoplasma and patient is not having symptoms because the patient is healthy but the patient is running fever that can be a cause ct chest can also be considered ultrasound abdomen to look for hepatosplenomegaly you do ultrasound abdomen you look for the lymph nodes as well sometimes the hidden lymph nodes can be even seen on ultrasound so these all things can give you a hint and if you find something on ultrasound then you can go towards the ct i'll come to the point of ct because there are some more important investigations that you can perform before doing going for the ct scans procalcitonin level procalcitonin level is an inflammatory marker and it is usually elevated in patients with bacterial infections procalcitonin level is normal in non infectious inflammatory conditions now let me explain it for you as i said that infections are a common cause of um, fever of unknown origin and when you perform the procalcitonin level if there is a bacterial infection the procalcitonin level will be high and if there is no bacterial infection but there is a hidden autoimmune condition going on hidden autoimmune condition like vasculitis systemic lupus erythematosus rheumatoid arthritis young female presenting to you with small joint pains pain that spare the distal interphalangeal joints look for autoimmune diseases perform the rf factor perform the anti ccp antibodies they usually turn out to be a rheumatologic disease rather than an infection in those cases the procalcitonin level will be normal because these are non infectious there is no infection in sle there is no infection in rheumatoid arthritis but these are inflammatory conditions these are autoimmune conditions the vasculitis so procalcitonin level will be normal in this condition so it means that it's not a bacterial infection so if you are confused between a bacterial infection versus a non infectious inflammatory condition you can perform the procalcitonin level crp is elevated in both the infectious as well as the non infectious inflammatory condition so crp cannot be used but procalcitonin levels can help you differentiate between infection and non infectious inflammatory conditions now there is a very simple test that you can perform as well as a test that can at least give you a hint that in which direction that you are going towards because it's all a matter of hints and it's all the matter of signs that you have to look for to take the direction in finding out the causes because every patient is different every case is different the test is called as naproxen test in naproxen test what you do is that you give naproxen to the patient naproxen is an nsaid and it blocks the production of certain interleukins inflammatory mediators it blocks the production of inflammatory mediators you give 375 mg per orally bd naproxen and you see does the fever subside if the fever subsides that is not something good if the fever resolves if the fever subsides it's likely malignancy not 100% it always depends upon the case but it's it will give you a hint that it is likely malignancy why does the fever resolve fever resolve because naproxen blocks the certain mediators that are produced from the malignancies and those mediators are blocked by naproxen therefore the fever caused by malignancy is resolved after giving naproxen but it does naproxen does not block the inflammatory mediators that are produced from infections that are produced during infections therefore the fever will not resolve by giving naproxen in cases of infections 
it will help you it's not something confirmatory but it will it is something that can help you that can aid you in making the diagnosis in finding the path a very important thing to remember in fever of unknown origin is the majority of the patients with fever of unknown origin present with atypical symptoms of the common diseases rather than the common symptoms of the rare diseases very important so you should always have the knowledge of atypical presentation of the common diseases and the common presentations of the atypical diseases or the rare diseases it's very important when you have performed these investigations and you have the hint that it is the infections causing it or it's the malignancy or it's the inflammatory conditions you go in that specific direction with those investigations if it is an infection, if the patient is having, if the patient is a uh, worker who is involved with the stools and feces, uh, cleaning up of the stools and feces, cleaning of the toilets, and that patient gets jaundice, that patient gets deranged RFTs, that patient is having anemia, this patient should be looked for leptospira. These patients, a patient presenting to you with fever and chills, and that fever subsides for some time and then he develops that fever and that is again associated with fever, rigors and chills and bilirubin is slightly deranged, there is hemolysis going on, the hemolytic markers are high, this patient should be looked for malaria. So this is how you move on towards the diagnosis, having the knowledge of certain diseases and looking for their markers. If you are suspecting inflammatory or rheumatic condition, you have to go for anti-nuclear antibody test in ANA test, if the ANA test is positive, it's the initial test, if the ANA test is positive, it's highly likely that there is an autoimmune condition in that patient. And you do the specific investigations. ANA is sensitive, ANA is not specific. It will tell you that there is an autoimmune condition. It will not tell you the, which condition is there. The specific tests for those diseases can tell you that this disease is present. If the ANA is positive and you are suspecting that the patient is having rheumatoid arthritis, go for NTCCP now. If the ANA is positive and that you are suspecting that the patient is having SLE, go for anti-Smith, anti-DSDNA antibodies. So ANA is the first test, then you go for the specific antibodies for those specific autoimmune conditions. Do rheumatoid factors, you can do creatinine kinase, you can do NCA test. So ANA is the first and the foremost test when you are looking for the inflammatory aromatic diseases. Harrison book of medicine classify ANA among the first tests that you have to do in a patient with fever of unknown origin. If you are suspecting malignancy, screen for lung carcinoma, screen for colon cancer, do colonoscopy, screen for breast cancer, perform breast examination, perform breast ultrasound in females less than 35 years of age, perform mammography in patients more than 35 years of age. Do PSA levels, do cervical smears, if not done already. Go for tumor markers like CA125 for ovarian carcinoma, AFP levels for liver cancer. These are the things that will hint you towards the malignancy. Then comes the advanced test. When you have performed all these baseline investigations, when you have performed the basic investigations, you are unable to find out anything, then you can go for a very important investigation. It's a, although a costly investigation and maybe in the resource limited setting, you might not be able to do it. But it's a very high yield investigation if you have the resources and if you have the facility. PET scan. In PET scan, they give certain agents to the patient and those agents are taken up by the areas of the body that have high metabolic rate. Wherever there is infection going on, there will be high metabolic rate. Wherever there is inflammation going on, there is high metabolic rate, there is increased cell turnover. Wherever there is malignancy, there is high metabolic rate, increased cell turnover. Those cells need those agents and those agents are absorbed by those cells. And when those cells absorb these agents, you take an image and you catch that where is the increased metabolic activity, where is the increased uptake. When you find the area of increased uptake, you go in that specific area. Let's say if there is increased uptake in the bones, increased uptake in the bones means that there is something, some problem with the bone marrow. Go for bone marrow biopsy, bone marrow cultures now. If there is increased uptake in the vessels, 
it means that there is vasculitis. Look for vasculitis in these patients. A patient is having hepatosplenomegaly. Patient is having cytopenia, low bone marrow, low cell counts, and there is increased uptake in the bone. Go for bone marrow biopsy. Go for bone marrow cultures. You know, typhoid can cause the cell all cell lines to go down because typhoid resides in the bone marrow, and it can cause pancytopenia. And do you know that bone marrow biopsy is the most specific test? For typhoid, you usually do not do bone marrow biopsy. You usually res reside on the cultures, blood cultures. But for the academic purposes, remember that bone marrow biopsy is also the most specific test for uh, for typhoid fever, because bone marrow cultures. If you grow typhoid in that, it's highly specific, and it can cause pancytopenia. If there is malignancy causing cytopenias, you can also catch that. So PET scan will guide you where you have to go ahead, and it is an advanced test, it's not an initial test. When initial test, you when you fail to find out the cause in the initial test, then you go for the advanced tests. CT tap, CT of the thorax, abdomen, pelvis comes after the PET scan. If you are in a resource limited setting where you do not have the facility, or if if the patient is non-affording, in that patient you go for CT tap. Harrison's classifier CT tap after. PET scan because CT tap you give a lot of radiation exposure to the patient but in resource limited setting CT tap is also a very wonderful tool to find out the cause you may be able to find out lymphadenopathy you may be able to find out any malignancy in the patient if there is an enlarged lymph node go for biopsy biopsy the posterior cervical lymph nodes supra or infraclavicular lymph nodes epitrochlear lymph nodes these have the highest yield sometimes there are enlarged lymph nodes in certain areas but those areas have low yield just because that they do not give you the specific diagnosis if a patient is having inguinal lymphadenopathy in inguinal lymphadenopathy if you take the lymph node biopsy that is a low yield lymph node biopsy because most of the time the results turn out to be a reactive lymphadenopathy reactive lymphadenopathy means that there is some kind of an infection mild infection and that has caused this lymph node to be enlarged you won't be able to find out any malignancy or big disease that you are trying to find out so you prefer certain areas for lymph node biopsy when you have to take it and you uh, you ignore certain uh, areas for lymph node biopsies like inguinal lymph nodes bone marrow biopsy bone marrow cultures avoid inguinal lymph node biopsy anterior cervical lymph node biopsy because this mostly turns out to be a reactive lymph node coming to the management of fever of unknown origin in the management of fever of unknown origin remember when a patient comes to you with fever of unknown origin you do the baseline investigation you stop all the medications for the next 72 hours to look for drug fever you do not give antipyretics to the patient you do not give steroids to the patient why don't you give antipyretics why don't you give steroids another important fact is one is to exclude the drug fever another important fact is that if you give these drugs to the patient if you give antibiotics to the patient if you are suspecting infection these antipyretics these steroids these antibiotics will mask the disease they will suppress the inflammatory markers of the disease and it will be very difficult for you to diagnose that patient because you have already suppressed the disease with steroids and the inflammatory markers your all the investigations will turn out to be a futile effort because you have suppressed the disease therefore it's important in fever of unknown origin to stop all the medications to stop all the treatments first investigate find out the cause and then go for the treatment usually in our settings where we work the patients are not patients and the patients lose their patience they say that just treat me straight away you do not know anything just give me the antipyretics just give me the antibiotics and get me treated you will have to make sure that you make the patient understand that how important it is to find out the cause of the fever avoid glucocorticoids they can mask the specific features of the diseases there are certain exceptions as well if you are suspecting that the patient is having temporal arthritis, there is increased ESR and there is tenderness over the temporal area, an old lady, old lady with temporal tenderness, headache, 
and increase ESR straight away give steroids because this is temporal arthritis. So these are certain exceptions in which you cannot take the risks. So in such cases you will have to give the medication like temporal arthritis. But in majority of the other cases where you are not suspecting anything really big, you do not give the medication. You first do the workup, you first find the cause. Avoid empiric antibiotic therapy in the stable patients. Like the empiric antibiotic therapy, when you even don't know the cause, it's not recommended in cure of unknown origin. Except in certain cases, except you suspect miliary TB, except you suspect that there is culture negative infective endocarditis, you hear a murmur, the murmur wasn't there. And when you do the echo, the transesophageal or transthoracic echo, and you are able to find out any clot sticking, any mass sticking with the uh, with the leaflets, this is most likely endocarditis. And the simple endocarditis is easy because the cultures turn out to be positive. It's the atypical infective endocarditis that is difficult to diagnose because the cultures are negative. It's the HESEC organisms. Therefore, you do the fundoscopy. You look for the signs, and then. When you have made the diagnosis, you go for the treatment. Neutropenic fever, there is neutropenic. I will discuss neutropenic fever in the next video in detail. I have a full video on neutropenic fever. And uh, in neutropenic fever, what happens is that oncology patient comes to you in the emergency with high grade fever. And when you take the history, they have taken, they have started some chemotherapy a few days ago. And after the chemotherapy, they are having fever. When you do the CBC with differential, you will find that C uh, neutrophil count is less than 500 that patient is having neutropenic fever and that has a different management. In these patients, you cannot delay the antibiotics. In these patients, you go for the antibiotic therapy. If you even suspect these things, give antibiotics. You cannot delay because the delay will harm the patient. Otherwise, in other cases, avoid empiric antibiotic therapy. First make the diagnosis, then give antibiotics. Harrison's has given this chart, the flow chart that I find very interesting and very good in understanding fever of unknown origin. I'll briefly skim through this so that you can get an idea. It says that fever of greater than 38.3 and illness lasting greater than 3 weeks as we discussed with no known immunocompromised state. You do history and physical examination first. You stop all the drugs that patient is taking. Stop antibiotics, stop steroids, stop antipyretics, stop everything and look for 72 hours perform the obligatory investigations. It says that these are the investigations that you will have to do in these patients. Patient is having fever for three weeks. You have to do these investigations. Go for ESR, CRP, the CBC. Go for electrolytes, the renal function test, total protein, protein electrophoresis for multiple myeloma, alkaline phosphatase, AST, ALT, LDH, creatinine kinase, ANA. As I said, ANA in Harrison is in the first line investigations. Rheumatoid factor, urinalysis, blood cultures three times, urine culture one time, chest x-ray, ultrasound abdomen, IGRA test for tuberculosis. Then it says that you should also exclude the manipulation with thermometer. You should check that how is the th th temperature being recorded, whether there is a fever or not. Because one of the very important thing is that sometimes people will, uh, patients will tell you that they are having fever. while there is no recorded fever on thermometer. When you check, when they are saying that they are having fever, you check, put the thermometer and the temperature is normal because it is a very relative term. It is a very subjective term that people use that I am having fever while they are having not fever. Maybe they are having just generalized body X and they think that this is fever. Mostly the patients that we see, we find out that they are not having fever and they just say that I am having fever because they are not uh, known. They don't know the term what fever means. So it's important that you record the fever. You make sure that the staff, the doctors, they make sure that, that there is actual temperature record going on for the patient. And the temperature, the thermometer should also be checked how it is being used. Another important thing is that in, in healthcare workers, in nursing staff, in females, in doctors, if they are admitted to you with fever of unknown origin and you, you are unable to find out anything in the workup, you should also have in mind factitious fever in these patients. You should also look for malingering in patients. You should also look for uh, some factitious thing going on that maybe they are trying to get some gain from getting admitted in the hospital. That should also be one of the differentials, especially in the healthcare workers. If you get a question in your exams 
and a healthcare worker, all the work workup is negative, no cause of fever, but the patient is having fever. Look for factitious fever, especially the 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 famous story of Menchosen's disease, where uh, where the men, Menchosen used to inject uh, feces into his skin, into his body, to get the fever, to get the sickness, just so that he can gain the uh, attention, medical attention. Stop or replace the medications to exclude drug fever. Then you look for potential diagnostic clues, the clues to diagnose, potential diagnostic clues. If the potential diagnostic clues are present, look for, go for the guided test. If the potential diagnostic clues are absent, do cryoglobins. Cryoglobins are elevated in inflammatory conditions like hepatitis C specifically. And in hepatitis B, these cases, it can also be raised. In multiple myeloma, cryoglobins can also be present. But hepatitis C is something that you should always remember for cryoglobulin. Go for fundoscopy to look for rot spots. Then you go for PET scan. And then the diagnosis goes on. So this is how you go on forward. First, you do the baseline investigations, the three domains that you have to look into. Then you go for the advanced treatment, advanced and invasive managements. And the take-home point is that fever of unknown origin most commonly is atypical symptoms of the common diseases rather than the common symptoms of the rare diseases. If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on infectious medicine, ECG lectures and all the other playlists on different subjects. In summary, we talked about what is fever of unknown origin, the different three domains that you have to look for, the causes in those three domains, miscellaneous causes, healthcare associated fever of unknown origin, the causes, immunodeficient patients, what you have to look for, how to make the diagnosis of fever of unknown origin, what are the first line labs that you have to go for? What are the imagings that you have to do? What is procalcitonin level elevated in bacterial infection? What is naproxen test to differentiate malignancy and infections? Then we went on towards some more tests, specific tests for the certain domains. Then we went on to advanced tests or the invasive tests, PET scan being the most important one management you stop all the drugs you don't give the treatment and there are always exceptions to these cases then we discussed the flow chart that is present in the harrison's to help you guide making the diagnosis and fever of unknown origin if you like my video please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on infectious medicine thank you very much If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on infectious medicine. The link